Welcome and bienvenidos. I am Christine Alcalde, uh, Vice President for Institutional Diversity and Inclusion here at Miami University, where we're in the middle of recognizing and celebrating Latinx Heritage Month. Uh, so I'm very happy, especially this month, but any month really, <laughs> to be here to have a conversation with Daisy Hernandez about her new book, The Kissing Bug, a true story, and I have it right here too, and I know she does too there. <laughs> the Kissing Bug, a true story of a family, an insect, and a nation's neglect of a deadly disease, which came out earlier this year. So thank you all for joining us, and thank you to those of you who've already submitted questions. We're also happy, though, to take your questions live, um, and I'll post them to Daisy on your behalf. So you can use the Ask a Question link below the video, and we'll include those questions as we go along. So in addition to being an associate professor of creative writing here at Miami University and my colleague, um, and being the author of The Kissing Bug, Daisy Hernandez is also the author of the incredibly engaging, award-winning memoir, A Cup of Water Under My Bed, which I cannot recommend enough. Wonderful book. <laughs> so, um, and also the co-editor of Colonize This, Young Women of Color on Today's Feminism. And of course, I also have that. <laughs> so, also highly recommended. Um, it's a book that's been widely used across campuses in gender and women's studies courses. And as a gender and women's studies scholar, I've used this in my courses as well. Mm -hmm. And she's also the former editor of Color Lines magazine. And she has written for numerous other publications and programs, including National Geographic, The Atlantic, The New York Times, Slate, and NPR's All Things Considered, and Code Switch. So thank you, Daisy, so much for sharing your time with us. Thank you, Cristina. Thank you for spending this time with me. And thanks to the Alumni Association for the invitation, too. It's exciting to be here. So maybe to start off, I know we're probably going to have lots of questions. We already had some submitted, but I want to start out. Um, this was such an engaging book to read for all of us who, who read it and who will read it. And this book you know, is very much about a specific disease. Yet, um, far from being simply being a documentary about the disease, it's also, I found, a really deeply engaging personal book. So we learned some about the family relationships that led you to do this research in your previous book, A Cup of Water Under My Bed. So can you share with us a little bit about how your family relationships inspired you to do this work and the impact of the disease that you focus on on your family and on your understanding of how families are impacted by diseases? Absolutely. Yeah. So this book, it is about Chaga's disease, which is a parasitic disease. And I first learned about it uh, at home with my family because I had an auntie who was diagnosed with this. And there was, of course, when, uh, you know, it's like five years old, you know, no one is explaining, you know, infectious diseases to me or anything about zoonotic diseases. So, but at that point, um, I, what, what my family, the reason my family was talking to me about it is because uh, they were relying on me to actually interpret or translate for my auntie and my other family members. I grew up in New Jersey, just outside New York City, um, very typical traditional immigrant family. Uh, my mother's side from Colombia, my dad's side from Cuba. Um, and my auntie was, you know, very fortunate to get a diagnosis, but um, didn't necessarily have the English skills to communicate. So at a really young age, I was actually talking about this disease, even though I didn't know what I was saying. I was just translating what I was learning in school of English. Um, and what, what ended up happening is, um, is that I grew up, you know, my, my whole life, I grew up pretty much in the shadow of this disease. My auntie um, was in the chronic stage. And I'm going to explain a little bit more about the disease, but I just want to share about how I was, um, what knowledge I had while I was growing up, which is, you know, we thought it was a very rare disease. We knew she was um, in this chronic stage that we thought, I thought my auntie would live forever, just kind of managing the symptoms. It was really difficult. There were years when she was hospitalized for weeks at a time, sometimes for months at a time. And then there were years that were really good, that she did really well. Um, she actually was able to get her teaching degree here in the United States. She ended up teaching Spanish in the public school systems in New Jersey. She ended up going on to get her master's degree in the Spanish language. She, she had a really amazing life. And then there would be these years where she would need surgeries or she would need to be hospitalized for these extended periods. And um, and so many, many years, you know, I was in my 30s when um, quite, you know, it was quite a shock to us when my auntie actually ended up dying from this disease. 
And, you know, it was really in the wake of that loss and trying to understand my grief that I realized how little I knew about Shaga's disease. And, and the nickname is, is kissing bug disease. And so that's part of the title because it's, um, it's a parasite that's transmitted by triotomine insects, which are nicknamed kissing bugs in English. And in Spanish, they have lots of other nicknames as well. Um, but when I started researching, I realized, oh my gosh, you know, I thought it was really rare. And there's actually 300,000 people in the United States who have Chagas disease. They just happen to be like my auntie, right? They are immigrants from South America or Central America or Mexico. Um, they often lived in rural communities or had a lot of contact with rural communities, which is how they came into contact with these insects. Um, Chagas disease is a little bit like Lyme disease, which I think is what most Americans are familiar with. You're, you're not going to get it from hanging out in a room with another person. You're going to get it from most often from having direct contact with the insect who's infected. Um, and it's an, it's, you know, it's just, it's kind of like a sort of like mind defying disease in some ways, this parasite. Um, once you're infected, you don't necessarily always have symptoms that get your attention. So my auntie, as far as we know, never, never knew that she had actually been infected. Um, and that's because in those first eight weeks, when in the acute phase of the disease, you might feel fatigue. You might have a swollen eyelid, actually, where some of that parasite material got into you. Um, but there are, but other than that, there's not, um, you know, alarming signals that something mm -hmm. has happened to you, actually. And so a lot of people just don't know and never actually end up getting diagnosed. Uh, and then the parasite can actually live in your body for up to three decades before you start to experience symptoms. So that's like 30 years of, you know, having this parasite in your system and not necessarily knowing that anything is wrong. And the parasite generally attacks the heart muscle. It can also attack the gastrointestinal system, which is what happened for my auntie. But for most people, the parasite will go after the heart. And about one in three people end up with these cardiac complications as a result. And so part of like, you know, in the wake of that loss of my auntie, I and realizing that there were so many families here in the United States. And then, of course, in the Americas, in Latin America, about six million people who have this disease. I realized there was no book about it. And there was very little material, very, very few stories for a, a lay reader like many of us are. You know, I think I think now because of COVID, many of us are much more literate in terms of science <laughs> articles and medicine. We've all become like, you know, a little bit of experts. But um, but there wasn't any book about this disease that I felt like could really speak to a wide readership. And I, I really wanted to know who were these other families, because while my auntie was alive, we really thought she was the only person who had Chagas disease. And so part of working on this book was like, I'm going to travel across the United States and find these families. And I did. I found doctors very much um, working as advocates for their patients who then connected me with all of these amazing families who gave many hours of their time to talk with me um, about the disease and about how this had impacted their families, um, including, you know, something that I the, probably, you know, one of the uh, first aspects of this disease that I that I learned that was really shocking to me was um, that there's a congenital form of this disease. So similar to the Zika virus, the parasite can pass from mother to baby during pregnancy. And we don't screen for that in the United States. We don't have guidelines for doctors to follow in terms of who should be screened for, for congenital Chagas disease. And so one of the patients that I write about in the book, Janet and her husband, Jose, mm -hmm. Uh, ended up, you know, with their baby um, born infected with this disease. And, and her baby's actually very lucky because he showed some symptoms and they had amazing doctors and they were able to get a diagnosis and get that baby treated because this disease, once it's in that chronic stage for adults, does not have a cure. We don't have a cure for this parasitic disease. Um, but for children, we do have medications that seem to... Um, to act as a cure, right? These medications seem to be really effective in children. And doctors don't know why it's effective in children, but not adults. I think all of us now with COVID can appreciate just 
what an incredible process it is for scientists to figure out all these details. Mm -hmm. but, um, but if we did screen for babies and we have as many as 300 babies in the United States born every year with Chagas disease, if we screen them, we could actually get them treated so that 30 years later, they're not facing um, irregular heartbeats and needing you know, cardiac interventions and even heart transplants as well. So, um, so that's kind of what got me started and ended up taking me all over the country. And also I went back to South America to interview my family and other families there as well. So, you know, following up on that, as you just mentioned also currently, you know, so much of our lives um, and our family lives are about COVID. Uh, we've been living this pandemic for a while, but as you also point out, and you were pointing to this about, you know, who's affected by this, immigrants from South America, from other places as well, um, racial and class disparities in healthcare really go beyond COVID-19, even though that is, of course, what we're focusing on mostly right now. And these have a long history. So can you talk to us a little bit more about why it's important to understand that there are these other infectious diseases like Chagas that really do deserve attention and education and prevention, as you were mentioning, and funding, even now as we're so impacted by the by this current pandemic. Yeah, you know, it's there's so many ways to go about, you know, thinking about this topic, right? And sometimes I like to remind people like, okay, let's just talk about the money, just straight up <laughs> the money, the money, like, like, you know, because that's a, that's a huge part of how our healthcare system functions, right? There's a profit element that's involved. There was an incredible economist who looked at just congenital Chagas disease, right? So just this one parasitic disease, this one aspect of it. And what she found was that, you know, if we can diagnose and treat babies and also um, give medication to the mom so that the parasite load in their body is lowered, we, it ends up being like 10 times cheaper, you know, more, more effective, you know, more, more financially efficacious, as they say, to do that than to wait for this disease to manifest decades later, where then you have to have defibrillators, you have to have heart transplants, you have to have some really serious interventions later. So just from a cost perspective, um, which I know people, you know, sometimes when I start off on the humanitarian angle, people end up going to the finance, but I'm like, no, actually it is cheaper. But I think one of the reasons that it's also so important from, you know, a, a larger perspective is that, you know, the way we think about these diseases really affects, um, public health policy, you know, how we go about thinking about public health in this country. So one of the conclusions that I came to in work, and I worked on this book for seven years, so I feel like I should say that, you know, I interviewed over, you know, 100 people, uh, families and experts in different, in different fields. And the conclusion that I actually came to, and this was before COVID, I was done writing the, right, the book, actually the entire book was written uh, and was done. I was handing it to my publisher as the pandemic was being declared. Um, but after working on it for these seven years, I came to this conclusion that we have really had a policy in terms of public health that's about containment rather than eradication. Um, so that if, if eradication is not like quick and easy and, and you know can't be done, we do settle for containment, right? Mm -hmm. And you just have to look at something like tuberculosis. A lot of people in the United States mm -hmm. never think about tuberculosis. It is like not a part of their lives. And where do you find it in the United States? You do overwhelmingly find it in immigrant communities. Mm -hmm. and you also find it in communities where people have spent time mm -hmm. in homeless shelters or in the prison system mm -hmm. so that people get living. But why do we also find it so much in the immigrant communities in the United States? Because we never made, um, you know, that policy, th those treatments, we never made them available across the world in a way that was sustainable, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so now we have strains that are resistant to the medications that we have. We never really eradicated and we didn't make a full commitment to that. Um, and the same, I would say, with HIV and AIDS. Uh, many of us do not think about HIV and AIDS, and many of us think of it as, as a problem that has been solved. It is an epidemic. And where is it an epidemic? In the, just in the United States, because a lot of times we think about other countries with HIV. But it is, it is a huge, huge problem here in the United States, in the South, in Black communities, especially among men, having relationships with other men. Um, but again, it's contained to that community. And so that's kind of the conclusion that I came to after seven years of working on this book. And, and so when COVID hit, it, I have to tell you, it was really jarring to see a lot of what I had um, been witnessing with Chagas, with tubercul you know, tuberculosis, with HIV, these kind of con this conclusion that I've been coming to, to then see it with COVID just 
even early on to see the testing sites were more likely to be opened in white, wealthier communities everywhere from Texas to New York City. Um, and journalists going out into these communities, figuring out, wait, why are the testing sites being opened up in these particular communities? So I think that's something it's important for us to think about, you know, um, because I think I hope COVID has really underscored for many of us that like we're all in this together, you know, we need these communities of care. It is not uh, it's not. Um, you know, it's not in our own best interest if we just want to think about it from a selfish perspective mm -hmm. to only take care of one small community or to only take care of one part of the country or even just our own country, right? Like, you know, it's public health has to be global health. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I, I love hearing that because yes, public health, it's never separate from all these racial and class disparities and gender disparities that you talk about in your book and it, you were just talking about. Um, so, and clearly we have so much more to learn about Chagas and about these other diseases and that's really important. So we do have a question that was submitted um, along the lines of getting more information about where can we find the kissing bug and is it present in the Midwest? You know, so can you tell us a little bit more about where we can find this and a little bit more perhaps about how the disease is transmitted? I can. And I also want to tell you that it is really um, just wild to me that I am here talking to you about insects, because as I write about in the book, when I began this project, I was terrified of all insects. Anything that crawled through the world really <laughs> freaked me out. Um, and yet I got over that and worked my way through it. I write about that in the book in part because I wanted to learn more. And one of the elements that was really surprising to me was that we do have these insects in the United States. So kissing bugs or triatomy insects mm -hmm. are generally found in the South, the Southwest and all over California. Um, however, they are being documented going further and further north in the United States. But historically, like where you're going to really find them is in the South, Southwest, because they they like a certain temperature. They don't like it too cold. They don't like it too hot. They, they are very... Um, Goldilocks kind of insects. Um, and the insects do function differently. You know, we have a different relationship with this disease in the United States. We do not um, worry about getting Chagas disease from the insects here in the United States as much. And the entomologists aren't quite sure why that is. You know, part of it might be the insects themselves um, and just how they're how these insects are able to transmit the parasite in the US versus in other parts of, of the Americas. Um, some of it might just be the level of exposure. You know, you oftentimes have to have repeated exposure to the insects and to many of them that increase, uh, you know, just reasonably, like that's going to increase your chances of being infected. And in the U.S., so in the U.S., a, a lot of communities do not have that kind of exposure to many, many insects repeatedly, to these particular insects repeatedly. And we also do have um, a lot, much easier access to pesticides. You know, we can go over to the Walmart and buy something that will kill pretty much, you know, everything in our backyard, essentially, right? I'm being a little, you know, silly there, but we do have much easier access um, to, to pesticides and other kinds of insecticides. And, you know, and that said, um, I always tell people, especially if you're in Texas, the Southwest, the South, different parts of California, um, you know, the Defense Department, so the U.S. military has had to think about Chagas disease and they've had to think about these insects because the Defense Department has its headquarters for veterinary care for military dogs in Texas. And so what they've ended up, what another part of this disease is called canine Chagas, which means that our dogs can pick up these insects or be infected, you know, be bitten by the insect as well and become infected. And they can have like a similar situation where they end up actually having cardiac complications, even dying from canine Chagas disease. And the military has figured out that they had dogs that were actually infected, dogs that had died from this disease. And so they've had to go, um, and this is from interviews with, with people who work for the military, They've had to go around the outdoor kennels um, and make sure that those are sprayed with insecticides. They've had to cut back the brush to make sure that these these bugs, um, they're not they're nocturnal insects. So they're not going to come and say hello to you during the day. They're going to wait until you're sleeping. And then that, that's when they're going to be sort of creeping and crawling out to get to you um, or to your dog. So I often tell people, too, like if you are in these parts of the country and you have dogs that you keep outdoors, 
make sure that you're treating the kennel, make sure that you're treating around your porches and that you're also mm -hmm. cutting back that brush. And you also can hop online and Texas A&M and College Station. They are the leaders on Chagas disease in the United States, and they have put together a really amazing guide for anyone who's in those parts of the country that might be um, afraid, you know, of having contact with the insects. But yeah, and, and bug repellent, when you get out there to do your camping, and I know some people are like, my sweetie, they don't want to put on bug spray. Bug spray is your friend. You do not, I, and I can say this because someone who did not end up in the book, but who I interviewed uh, and, and really appreciated her story. She went camping with her family in Northern California um, and she got infected by an insect native to California during this camping trip. Um, and it's very arbitrary, you know, it was like a few nights of camping. Her children were not infected. Neither was her husband. She ended up for whatever reason being the one who ended up infected. So uh, bug spray and as much cover as you can have if you're doing outdoor stuff is, that's what you want to do, yeah, to protect yourself. That's fascinating. And to be able to learn all that as I was reading this and then hearing this and thinking, that's right, it's everywhere. You, we don't really know enough about it. So I have um, a couple of things that you brought up. I had a wanted to ask you a question and you said something. So I'm just going to pose both and you can <laughs> decide. Um, but first of all, you know, based on your research, clearly you've done, you've interviewed so many different people. But would you say that doctors here in the U.S. and in Latin America, so two separate in the U.S. and one instance in Latin America, really know enough about Chagas or what's what are the barriers? Because right? clearly we need to know more. So what are some of the barriers there? And then you just brought up a story that you didn't include in the book. So then maybe if we can then transition to the process as to how you decided which stories to include and which not to include. But first, you know about the doctors and the knowledge that they have. Historically, doctors in the U.S. have not known about this disease because it was really really thought of as a disease that would only be found in South America or Central America or Mexico. And, you know, unfortunately, they were not thinking necessarily about immigrant communities in the United States. So uh, historically, there's been very little knowledge. The part where that also becomes really painful is with, um, with specialists in gynecology, obstetrics, that they know so little as well. Um, we and, and so that has begun to change. Actually, just in the seven years that I was working on this book, I did start to see that change in terms of at least Chagas disease being on the radar, I guess is what I would say of doctors. Um, the CDC has also been funding a lot more educational programming. So I went to a pretty incredible symposium in New York City at a medical school there. Um, the only challenge that I, that I, that I continue to see or that I, I, I can anticipate in some ways is that pretty much everyone in that room was an infectious disease specialist. But immigrant communities in the United States, um, and I can say this from my own family, we, we never knew that there was anything, we did not know about infectious disease specialists. We did not know the whole process of, you have a primary care doctor that gets you to these other specialists, right? Um, that was something that we had to find out. And so part of what I can see as a challenge is that more doctors are learning in their field in infectious diseases, which is wonderful, that needs to happen. But those are not the first doctors that immigrant communities will come into contact with. They'll first come into contact with either a primary care or a doctor working in the emergency room, actually, because a lot of what ends up happening with people that I interviewed is that they end up having these irregular heartbeats that become really intense, overwhelming, and they end up in the ER. Uh, a lot of times, you know, even if they have access to health care through the Affordable Health Care Act, um, it's important to remember that actually before... Obamacare, Latinx communities in the United States were the least insured community. Um, so that's made a huge difference. But even when they have that, people don't necessarily have the kind of work lives where they can take off the morning to go see a doctor about a little concern, right? Um, you know, they, they sometimes don't even have transportation. Some patients that I talked to had to, you know, pay significant amounts to like a friend or a family member. These are not, you know, these are people like my parents who they don't have like the Uber app on their phone. They don't even have a cell phone, right? Or they have like one of the old school phones, not the smartphones. So there's a lot of barriers to getting to that specialist, actually. So um, I'm hopeful that as this disease starts to be more on the radar, that it's going to be on the radar of doctors who are working emergency rooms or are working in community health clinics as well, really directly with these uh, with immigrant communities, because that's that's a huge barrier. And then, yes, you asked about the research and 
It is, uh, you know, you work on a book for seven years, so um, it, it not everything that you find is going to end up in the book. I, I was very lucky that I had already, you know, worked for many years as a journalist before I came into higher education. My my first career was in journalism and publishing, and so I already knew that, you know, if you want to write, uh, and I say this to my students all the time now, I'm, you know, I'm telling them that they're writing these 800 word essays. In creative nonfiction classes, and I'm, and they're always like working towards the 800 words, and I'm always telling them, no, you actually want to have like 2,000 words, and then cut it back to 800. And um, and from a journalism perspective, you need enough material for a 3,000 words when all you have is 800 words. You know, so I was lucky that I knew that. You know, like I had that kind of uh, sort of very fundamental knowledge of journalism. So in terms of transferring it to a book, I knew that I basically needed material, you know, probably for three books <laughs> so that I could have, you know, what I actually needed for this book. But it was, you know, it was difficult, you know, it was difficult, especially there was, so there's a whole part of the book that is the patient stories, is these experiences from different patients across the United States. And um, I had to make some really hard decisions. And, and part of it was, some of it was actually the patients themselves, how much they were willing to share with me. Because in order to write a book like this, this isn't this, this, is in this realm of creative nonfiction and specifically literary journalism. So it wasn't only the who, the what, the when, the where, right? I was asking patients, okay, that day, um, before you got to the emergency room, like what were you wearing? What were you thinking about that morning? Um, what, you know, what were you, what was on your mind? You know, what, what did you pack for the trip that you took that particular day on such a, I was asking them the sort of minutia of their day-to-day -day lives. So some of it really depended on the patients themselves and how willing and how open they were to spend time with me trying to remember, showing me photos. Um, so the mom that I spoke about before, that was like a big part of our interviews. And our interviews happened um, over the course of about two years. Um, so they were really spaced out, right? Um, and it included, you know, her pulling out photos from that day when she ended up in the emergency room, when she was bleeding nonstop and what a horrific day that was. And I'm having to like, you know, make some very uh, difficult decisions about how slowly or how quickly I'm going through the interview process with her, because this is asking someone to re-experience a really, really painful ex moment from her life, right? But I'm also asking her to show me photos. So some of the decisions were really based on the patients. And then some of it was also deciding, you know, what was most necessary for a reader to really understand the full scope of this disease. So one patient that I include in the book is someone who was born and raised in Texas. She has barely traveled outside of the state of Texas and she ended up infected with Chagas disease um, from insects you know, there in Texas. And I thought, okay, that story was really important to tell because it really underscores that although this is not, uh, we don't have to worry in the same way. The CDC has only found mm -hmm. not even 100 people who have been infected with insects that are native to the United States. Even though it's not this huge raging problem, it does happen. Um, and I wanted readers to understand and to appreciate her story and those other 100 people who have this experience. And then I also included stories of people who, one patient who got to the point where the defibrillators were no longer working. He needed a heart transplant, actually. And I thought it was important for, for readers to see the scope of like, you can live with this in the chronic stage and actually be fine and not have health complications, like this woman in Texas, um, like some others. Um, but then there's another patient who on the other extreme ends up needing a heart transplant. So some so the decisions were like, you know, how much they were willing to share with me. And then also like what I felt like the readers also needed to understand the scope of the disease. But it's very hard. In the acknowledgments, I have a lot of thank yous to people whose, whose stories I couldn't include. Yeah. Sure. It sounds like you you clearly spoke with so many different people. And I love how you said that we need so much more material than what actually goes into a book. Because I think often reading books, we don't realize that at that point. So I want to mention we received one comment um, for you from Connie H. 
Thanks, Stacy. I've learned to become friends with bugs, especially spiders. <laughs> so enjoying your talk very much. I first heard you on NPR, and I want to make sure we invite everyone again to please submit your questions if you have any for us, um, so Daisy can address those. And um, along with that, you know, you mentioned how long it took to write this book, seven years. So I'm assuming part of this time you were here at Miami. And so I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about how that worked being a faculty member here at Miami, working on this book, what that process was like. Yeah, it was incredible. I actually think when I arrived at Miami, I had maybe been working on the book for about a year, a year and a half or so. So most like pretty much all of my work happened while I was here at Miami. And it was incredibly supportive, first of all, because, um, you know, my colleagues were really interested in what I was doing. <laughs> I think sometimes people think that um, sometimes people have this image that writers you know, uh, go off into this little room for seven years and then they come out with the book. It doesn't work that way, actually, especially, you know, in nonfiction. We actually need to be in connection with others and to feel supported and buoyed, you know, by, by others over, over the years. So I really appreciated the, the support from my colleagues. I had research funding as well so that I could make those research trips um, across the country and be able to uh, not always necessarily be crouched, you know, uh, crashing on someone's sofa, like sometimes I got to stay and sometimes there wasn't a sofa to sleep on. So, um, so the research funding made a huge difference in terms of um, being able to do that traveling, being able to also go to South America mm -hmm. and be able to interview both families and also experts there and to be able to um, appreciate their knowledge there. Um, so yeah, the research funding was huge. And then also I teach creative nonfiction um, and I always have a literary journalism component or section to my courses. So it's been really wonderful. I'm usually introducing students to that type of writing. And so it was really great to be able to say to them, you know, yes, like, you know, I'm interviewing someone, I'm asking them to show me photos of their lives. You know, I'm asking to, I'm, right. I'm asking them about the weather. I'm going online to, to match up what they're telling me with what I can find in terms of, you know, if they told me that day was sunny, yes, I am online trying to figure out if that day, that time of the year was really sunny <laughs> or how hot it was. Um, so also like that actually is such a wonderful, I love that we have had that, you know, we have this research um, or this, this scholar teacher Mm -hmm. model at Miami because they really do reinforce one another. And so a lot of times, you know, when I was telling students what I was doing, it was really, you know, supporting me and underscoring mm -hmm. the kind of work that I was doing and and reminding me of how hard it is, actually. It's, it's not easy to win over someone's, um, you know, confidence or someone's trust in you. Uh, it takes time, you know, and my students are doing like uh, sort of a, a microcosm of what I'm doing over the course of seven years they're doing in seven weeks, right? So um, so it's always like an adventure introducing them to this um, this form. And it's it's been wonderful. It's been very gratifying. That's wonderful. And it sounds like you have um, some more advice to give, at least we're hoping, because we have another question from <laughs> Katarina Palmer, who asked, do you have any advice for those looking to write creatively about Latinx issues? Yes, I would say take my intro to Latinx literature course next spring. <laughs> but so, but, but I say I say that half joking in the sense that um, I think a lot of times um, we forget that in order to do something creatively, we really have to immerse ourselves in what the artists are doing right now. So I would say. Um, to write creatively about Latinx issues, it's important to look at what Latinx authors are doing right now, the novels that are coming out, the poetry books, the works of nonfiction that are to really immerse yourself in that, in that, you know, creative practice that's already happening. So I would say that's the first thing. And then I oftentimes will tell people, you know, start with um, taking a class, uh, some kind of creative writing class, whether it's being given in a community context or, you know, there's so much happening virtually now too, which is really wonderful. And just this past summer, I taught virtually um, through a, a nonprofit in Texas called Macondo, which was actually started by this iconic Chicana author named um, Sandra Cisneros. People probably know The House on Mango Street. She's written many, many other books as well, but people tend to really know that one because it's sold millions and millions of copies and was translated into many, many languages around the world. But, uh, but, I, but she started this, um, this nonprofit, essentially. It's a writing workshop that happens every year. And she started it because she wanted there to be a space for people 
both Latinx writers and also for people who were um, community advocates or community activists who needed to have like a space where people understood the kind of writing that they were trying to do. So I always say immerse yourself, you know, in all the cre wonderful creative work that's happening. Um, and then also like look for um, community writing classes like Macondo. Um, I'm also just thinking in uh, Grub Street in the Boston area. I know they've, I, I'm pretty sure they've had their classes online. The Loft in Minneapolis um, has also, a lot of these places all went virtual with their classes. The, writing, the Writer Center in the DC area as well. It's just a really great way, not only to get into the creative work, but also to, um, to find like-minded writers Mm -hmm. um, and then my third idea, actually, I have to pitch the Bookstagrammers. And for those of you who are not familiar with Bookstagrammers, these are folks on Instagram who essentially make it their job to let people know about certain books. And we have amazing Latinx Bookstagrammers. I'm going to be doing uh, an Instagram live interview with one of them, uh, with Edis on Friday. If you follow me on Instagram, I'm going to be posting that info. But they are wonderful in terms of like, like I'm constantly, I'm like, wow, I thought I was keeping up. And then I go on Instagram and I find out about a whole slew new book, set of books that's coming out. So they, they are really wonderful. And once you connect with one of them, you know how it is. You'll connect with all of them. <laughs> That's wonderful. So we have some more questions coming in. So let me um, read one of them. So this is from Elise Rodina. So hi, Daisy. She says, I just finished the audiobook on my way to campus this morning. Yay. <laughs> it is so lovely. I wonder if you might talk a bit about how you conceptualize the weaving of your family's memoir with your discovery journey as you learned about the kissing bug disease. It reads like a story, but it's also so informative. Creative nonfiction is a genre I'm curious about. So any tips for those of us who are eager novices? Eager novices, take my class. Intermediate nonfiction also next semester. I'm just kidding. Um, well, I would say in terms of taking classes, um, actually specifically with creative nonfiction, I often recommend um, the magazine called Creative Nonfiction teaches classes online. I have taken them myself and I think they are fantastic. They're often um, also taught asynchronously. So in turn, for those of us, all of us <laughs> who work crazy hours, it can be really wonderful in terms of taking the class at your own pace. Um, and I'm not promoting it, you know, for any other reason other than like, I actually really, I've done it myself as, as a student and they, those classes have been wonderful. So creative nonfiction magazine, look it up. It's fantastic. Um, and yes, thank you so much for saying about this, the weaving together of the memoir. I love how you said it there, the memoir and the discovery journey. Because that that was so important to me, but I will be honest with you when when my when we first sent this uh, book proposal to different publishers, I was actually not planning to have a memoir angle to this book at all. Um, I I was so focused on the stories of patients and everything that I was learning, and I didn't I didn't know I was still also like in so much unspoken grief around losing this family member who had been like a mother to me. And we had a complicated relationship, which I write about in the book. My Tia Dora was incredible and beautiful in many ways, but she did not accept me being um, identifying as bisexual, being very out as a queer Latina woman. Uh, she didn't talk to me for many years after I came out. So it was also a very painful relationship. And I just kept thinking, who wants to hear about this? No one wants to. Yeah, I, I was saying some of what my students say to me is like, no one wants to know about me and my story. I was actually saying that as well. And it was my wonderful editor, Macy Cochran at Tin House, who said, you know, what do you think about developing the memoir part of this experience, like writing more about your relationship with your auntie? And I will be forever grateful to her because um, I think that helped me actually to develop the voice that I needed to use when I was writing about the science, when I was writing about the stories of other families. I think it was so important to first have the memoir uh, aspect to the book. Uh, and that said, it was really, um, uh, it was really hard. I think it was like the 11th hour when my editor and I finally realized what the structure of the book would be. So I had chapters and chapters that were done and they were in a really different order than what you heard on that audio book. Um, at the last moment possible, it just, um, and as I, as I, so we have a, an MFA program in creative writing. And a lot of times my, my graduate students are very worried about the structure of their, their thesis, which is going to be like their book manuscript. 
And I say to them, you know, we can we can make up a structure together right now. And I can guarantee that it will be different by the time that you get to the end of this project <laughs> years from now, it'll be really different, you know, or we can just get your, get you into the writing, get you on, you know, writing, 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 um, generating the material that you're going to be working with and shaping and molding. Cause it's not about first drafts, right? It's about shaping that. Well, it's more like shaping draft number 17 into something, um, so I t and I tell them and I, I really use my experience with this book as an example. Like the structure will come. I am I now have total faith and 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 I'll, you know in order to qualify that I'll also say that I spent months. I can't even tell you how many months I spent with like studying the structure in other books, po post it notes all over the wall walls in my little office. You know, trying to figure out what you know what would work, and then it just um, you know it just it just finally came together. I think like sort of all that work finally just one day, uh, literally like one day I sat down and I was like, wait, I could do this. Um, but I will say that the the moment, you know, when I realized the structure was realizing that or was appreciating that I wanted readers to understand parts of the disease um, before I got to the experiences of other families so that the reader had that knowledge um, before we got to their stories, but that they, the reader could still experience um, kind of growing up with this disease and not knowing a lot about it. So, so I was making some very strategic decisions, but it took time, you know, it's like, there's a reason it took seven years. And that's, that's one of those reasons was figuring out the structure. And so much of what you're saying is both about the structure and bringing in so many different genres, so many different areas, <clears throat> disciplines even. And so we have a question again from Katarina, and um, she's a Latina biochem pre-med student interested in infectious diseases and, <clears throat> excuse me, and their intersection with sociological issues. So she mentioned she's done a lot of independent research on Chagas disease and looks forward to reading your book. That's great. Um, for more in-depth look. And she wants to know if there are any Miami resources that you know of for uh, STEM lab research related to these sort of illnesses or any advice you may have for people in her situation. Yeah, I'm going to... Um... Let's talk on email, <laughs> but I'm going to be speaking with a class, I think next week. Yeah, next Tuesday, a class at Miami about Chagas disease. Um, so there's there are resources in terms of classes that are being taught with a focus on global health. And uh, as you know, our students or as you might know, maybe you don't know, but yeah, our students in public health have been just incredible in terms of like also working with our campus community on COVID. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, this past, uh, yeah, I guess it's almost going to be two years. It's incredible. Um, so there are resources. I'm not on the STEM side. I am on the humanity side. So, um, so I'm not familiar, like in terms of other illnesses and in terms of um, other work that's happening. Uh, in, in the U.S., you know, a lot of the work has happened at places, in terms of academics, has happened at places like Texas A&M. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a school of tropical medicine down in Houston at Baylor College. So I could definitely point you in those directions. They've done a lot of work on Chagas at the University of Miami in Southern Florida. The medical school there has actually sent their students um, to South America to get more training about Chagas mm -hmm. disease because they know that they're serving um, a huge community of um, immigrants, or, and not even only immigrants, but also, as you all may know or appreciate people in, in South Florida who go back and forth a lot. Um, their, their family and their work lives include um, all of the Americas. And so, and so th they were realizing like, we actually need to have our doctors here trained uh, on Chagas disease and a, and a slew of other kind of zoonotic diseases. So yeah, so I'm happy to like point you in those directions if you want to email me. <laughs> Thank you so much. And so as we wrap up, you know, your book is about so many different things. And also having read your work before, you cover gender, racialization, migration, and across so many different things. So for those reading this book who have read it or who are going to read it, um, you know, what are a couple of things, one or two things that you would really like folks to take away from this? Oh, so, so many messages. Um, I definitely, you know, I'm pretty ambitious with my with what I hope people will take. So, so I have this kind of like really lofty goal that um, that or or hope, I guess, is the way to say it that that readers will really think about um, 
you know, consider the question of, you know, how do we choose which communities we take care of? Mm -hmm. You know, how do we, how do we choose which members in our own community we take mm -hmm. care of? And I think with COVID, this is really, really pressing uh, in terms of where the vaccine goes in the United States. Like I was just one of many, many families that really struggle to get my parents vaccinated because they don't have access to a car. They don't have access to smartphones. Um, so getting them vaccinated and they're in Florida now and getting them vaccinated was quite, it was just an incredible, unfortunate ordeal into some, in, before some policy changes happened. So I really feel like my hope is that readers are going to like, look at this and, and really start thinking about, yeah, I'm part of a community, you know? And so I take care of myself and I take care of those around me as well. Um, like it can't just be, um, we take care of our tiny little corner over here and, and good luck to everyone else. I'm really hoping that this like opens up a different way of, of thinking about global health. And then I am really hopeful that, um, that this raises awareness among readers who might know healthcare professionals who are like, Hey, you know about Chavez disease? I was reading a book about it. Um, and so I'm hopeful that, you know, for those medical professionals, not only doctors, but also nurses as well, nurse practitioners, anyone who comes into contact with, you know, like one of the things that, that a doctor told me who I was interviewing was that, you know, you end up in the emergency room uh, with a young, and this was what happened to, to him, you know, ended up in an emergency room with a young man who was in his, he was in his 30s or in his 40s. And he was already at the start of like heart failure. And he was otherwise very, very healthy. And he did not know about Chagas disease, right? So he did not know to even consider this. But if you have a patient who is otherwise very healthy, and has connections to certain parts of Latin America, uh, you want to be able to think about shot. You want to rule that out, you know? So I'm hopeful that like the book will get it on the radar that, that there might be someone in an emergency room who thinks, wait a minute, you know, what about that thing that shock is, should we rule that out as a possibility? So I am really hopeful. I feel like that's like very, very lofty, but I'm still hopeful that like the way word spreads that, that, that will happen. And then, um, you know, I am, I'm also really, really ambitious that like we will rethink how we deliver healthcare in this country. Um, and um, I, I suspect that COVID maybe has changed how some people think about it, but just ensuring that we all have access to healthcare, that it is a human right, and that we think about it as a human right, as opposed to like uh, something that comes along with the job that I have. You know, um, I know so many people who they take specific jobs because it's going to have health insurance attached to it you know, um, and people who have to make, you know, make certain sacrifices because, okay, I'm going to have insurance, health insurance with this job. Uh, so I think sometimes people think, oh, you know, the Affordable uh, Health Care Act took care of this. But no, a lot of people still make some really difficult decisions based mm -hmm. on how they're going to get access to health care. So I am hopeful that we can like reimagine, right, what health care can be like and that it's a human right. That would be amazing. <laughs> I hope so. So yes, um, I agree with everything you're saying. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, and thank you, Daisy, for sharing your time, all your time with us and for this really great discussion and all the information that you've provided. And of course, to everyone who's joined us for these great questions, both that were submitted and the live questions and the comments that were sent in and to the Alumni Association for making all of this possible. Um, we can also share with you Daisy's website and we can find more information about this book and about uh, her other books and other projects there as well and it's right there so good on screen and also for those of you who are in or near Miami I look forward to seeing you at the Across the Divide conference tomorrow and at many other events in the future but thank you so much again Daisy and thank you all so much um, so good afternoon and buenas tardes thank you. buenas tardes bye everyone bye.